The everyday information torrent can be overwhelming. Anyone can broadcast anything instantly online. What to believe and how to cope with the everyday info overload? Let's ask Dr. Gina Loudon, whom you know as a political pundit here and on other cable news channels. But tonight she's wearing her other hat, her day job, psychologist. And news media consultant Jim Farley was both an ABC and NBC News executive. And he and I are radio brothers. We both managed Washington's top-rated all-news radio station, WTOP, the ultimate dashboard appliance. So Jim and I became accustomed to competing for mentally multitasking motorists' attention. Thank you both for being here. Nice to be here. Pleasure to be with you. Jim, media consumption uh, competition is fierce, but I love that sign you hung in the newsroom at WTOP. Get it right, then get it first. Now, without editors or filters, those feeding social media contribute lots of what we now call fake news. How can the consumer know what to believe? A consumer simply has to develop a good, healthy BS meter. Uh, and there's a, a fair amount of teaching we need to do to help them do it. Um, we need to try to show them the difference between an actual news organization that has gatekeepers, people like editors or fact checkers who will say, are you sure? Do you have a second source? And by the way, two tweets is not two sources. Um, and the, the, the media itself has a job to do in restoring its trust. It really lost trust when it totally blew the 2016 election cycle. Yeah. Uh, Jim, are you uh, uncomfortable with all these uh, stories full of unnamed sources? Very uncomfortable. There's no good reason for a lot of them to be unnamed sources. Uh, it's just too easy for a journalist um, to do a story that way, to persuade somebody to go on the record. I mean, these sources could be, you know, a cook in the White House. You know, a White House source says, that doesn't tell us anything. Or a source familiar with the topic. Right. That tells us nothing. You know, that erodes your credibility. Right. And I think one of the reasons that journalists are doing so many unnamed sources is that they've moved from PJS, proper journalistic skepticism, to outright cynicism. Hmm. Great quote from David Broder, who's one of the most respected uh, Washington reporters, he said, cynicism is epidemic right now. It saps people's confidence in politics yep. and public officials, and it erodes both the standing and standards of journalism. But wait for it. He said this in the 1990s, six presidential election cycles ago, and it's gotten more negative uh, and more cynical ever since. Well, and more partisan, Gina, news media play it straight less lately. Whatever one chooses to believe is validated by whichever news providers we choose. Are we now less curious about other points of view? We have become very tribal in our media consumption, and I think that it's very unhealthy for a myriad of reasons. The, the political reasons are right there as well. But I think it causes a lot of stress and anxiety to the average person to be so angry all the time at anyone who disagrees with you and to be so intolerant, as many have become, to uh, those who might have a different opinion than you. I think one of the most reckless, and you and I have talked about this on your show before, Holland, but I think one of the most reckless things we can do is say, you know, we should never discuss politics or religion. Quite the contrary. We should be able to be adults and engage in civil discourse and to f a disagree in friendly ways, as you and I often do, <laughs> and to still be good friends or still claim to be relatives or whatever that is. But we've really lost that civility in our culture. And I think it's very sad. And I think that the mass amounts of media coming at us like a fire hose are a big part of the problem because you can't read everything, right? So what people tend to do is to gravitate toward what they already believe. And uh, in, in psychology, we call it cognitive dissonance. And it's putting the information that you gain into a file that you already have. Right. And where you come into conflict with your own brain is when you have new information that doesn't fit in one of your files. We should be, in, we should be creating new files every day, Holland, and I don't think we 
are. Well, now to that point, Jim, grade the media. Since you left day-to-day -day management of news organizations, what do you now see and hear and read with fresh eyes and ears, meaning the forest, that you might not have noticed when you were there in the trees? Well, I was definitely in the trees because I spent my entire career in the Acela Corridor, New York and Washington. I now live in Florida, and it's very different. Um, I, I like Dr. Gina's word, tribal. Uh, in three different news organizations, I was the news executive who would handle accusations of bias. And what I came to find was that when there was an accusation, it really meant that the message you were delivering was not comfortable to the strongly held opinions of the person complaining. Uh, and that's why people who are conservative tend to go to Fox News and liberal to MSNBC or CNN. Um, they, they want something that reinforces what they're thinking. That tribal word is really good to describe what the media has made the audience. Uh, now, and I really think there's a lot of media responsibility. Yeah, you speak to the quality. Gina, what about the sheer quantity? Has all this stuff coming at us made us more susceptible to diversion and distraction? You spoke about anxiety. Uh, have we become a short attention span society? Yeah, the, the bad news is that the answer to that is clearly, I don't, think if there, I, I don't think there's anyone out there that would disagree that that is the case. But necessity is also the mother of invention, as we know. And so the fact that the news is coming at us in such a fire hose manner, it also does force us to look more, skeptical, more skeptically at the information we consume. That can be a good thing because critical thinking, I mean, nobody wants uh, an entire viewership or audience that isn't thinking for themselves. So as we start to realize that we can't consume all the news coming at us, we have to become a little more skeptical, perhaps a little more cynical. Yes, and I hear that. But the flip and better side of that is that we do have to think first and we're not just believing believing everything that we're hearing on the news. I think back to when I was a little girl and there were basically three networks and that's where you got your news and that was the beginning and end of it. So everybody just kind of believed everything that the news media said. That's not the case anymore and I don't think that's all bad. So there is an upside here. You're right. Uncle Walter said that's the way it is. And, and he was trusted. Yeah, he did. Let's and take he a look was at trusted. Yep. Go ahead, Jim. Holland, let's take a look at where the, the news is coming from. We've lost over 200,000 journalism jobs. Uh in cities and towns. There's been a net gain in digital news jobs, but where are they? They're not in Hiawatha, Kansas. They're in New York, Washington, or the Pacific Crescent. So our, the major national news media, including the new digital media, live either in the Excella Corridor or the Pacific Crescent. It's a coastal bubble and it's a liberal bubble. Yeah, and I think that uh, local news well covered is all the more conspicuous, but you're right, the uh, firings have really clobbered a lot of the depth and perspective. Jim, has President Trump's outspoken disdain for unfavorable coverage and Rush Limbaugh characterizing legacy publishers as drive-by media caused people to be skeptical about institutional news providers? I, I th think it certainly hasn't helped uh, journalism but the cynicism and skepticism on the part of the audience for what the news messages has been started long before there was a Fox News. Uh, it's not new. A lot of this is the perception, and you can find polls going back 20, 30 years that people think that there is a bias in the media. And Trump just fed into that, and Limbaugh feeds into it. Gina, I got uh, uh, just enough time to voice a real pet peeve, and I think you and I may have talked about this off the air. I find instant messages annoying because they make my phone beep, they're interruptive. Unless it's urgent, I'd prefer people email me. But in today's instant gratification, 140 character culture, are social graces suffering and will manners be all the more conspicuous? Hmm. 
That's a great point. And that's another case, Holland, where you so eloquently describe that there's an upside and a downside to most of the ways media is changing. Look, media is going to change. There's nothing we can do about that. People are going to communicate in, a, you know, zero time. It's all going to, they're going to expect turnaround on a dime. So there's nothing we can do about that. But the good news about that is that uh, we can get more information quickly. We can study up on a topic, you know, where we used to have to go to a library and dig through a card catalog now. <laughs> How we can get that information in zero time and so so there's a good side too and well, I prefer to try to look at that one well I uh, since the doctor is in uh, let's all just jump on the couch for a second do you have any professional advice for unplugging and de-stressing I never de unplug so if I did I'd have to take my own advice I'm not good at it <laughs> I love the challenge of the day-to-day -day. I love the news cycle but here is my challenge to your audience Holland that is Try at least, spend five minutes a day or 5% of your news consumption listening to somebody that disagrees with you rather than constantly listening to the yes men out there. Yeah, be curious. Jim, I got about a minute left. Be curious. What is your advice to your clients, the news organizations that you consult, about conveying their credibility to the audience? How do they say, believe us? Uh, they've got to be relevant and they've got to be good storytellers. It's got to be relevant to the audience. They don't want to listen to angry guys arguing. Uh, they want to hear what's important in their own lives, what's going to save them money, what good things are happening in their schools, are their families safe, are their communities safe. This is the kind of thing people care about. And I'm sure hoping that they can fix the business model for local news organizations, newspapers, radio and television because that's where we can get a return to decent, believable journalism with credibility. Yeah, local is conspicuous. Uh, Warren Buffett has been buying up all those small newspapers because of high school sports. It's a real franchise. Hey, thank you, Dr. Gina Loudon and Jim Farley. And uh, folks, uh, bear in mind Great what you've idea. heard here and be a careful news consumer. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Holland. Tonight. The Winter Olympic Games are underway in frigid South Korea, where things are at least a little warmer as athletes from North and South Korea compete together. That's the big picture. If you missed any part of this week's show, or if you'd like to share it, hit youtube.com slash the big picture RT where you can find all our shows and you can watch them anywhere, anytime on any device. I'm at Holland Cook on Twitter. And if you follow me, I'll follow you. Until next week, question more.